It is my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Rachel Zvia back, poet and translator, uh, who has published three poetry collections and five collections of Hebrew <coughs> verse in translation. Her most recent translation is On the Surface of Silence, the Last Poems of Leah Goldberg. Her previous translation collection in the Illuminated Dark Selected Poems of Tuvia Rubner won the Times Literary Supplement Translation Award of 2016 and was shortlisted for both the National Literary Translation and Jewish Book Council Awards. Her recently completed new poetry collection is titled, What Uses Poetry the Poet is Asking. Back is a senior lecturer of English literature at Oranim College in Israel, and she lives in the Galilee where her great, great, great grandfather settled in the 1830s. So this is a modest bio, uh, but maybe it's better to optimize our time with what Dr. Back has to share with me, just adding this. Uh, Judaism considers the seat of intelligence uh, to be in our heart. Um, I have known Rachel since high school in Buffalo, um, and I don't know anyone more whose intelligence and eloquence flows directly through her heart, um, which you get to hear tonight. Thank you, Rabbi Linder. Thank you for having me back. I visited here exactly five years ago, and it's an honor and delight to return. I am overwhelmed by the vibrancy of your congregation. I don't know if you know how extraordinary it is. It's a wonder to behold. I also feel quite privileged to be here on a bat mitzvah Shabbat, Mazal Tov Drew. It was a privilege to hear you sing and to watch your parents' faces. <laughs> Whole galaxies were lit up at that moment. On my previous visit here, I spoke from this bima on parashat Truma, last week's parasha. I started my drasha, my sermon then, by sharing with you how upon reading Truma, with its detailed set of instructions to the people of Israel on how to build the mikdash, the sanctuary, I felt disappointment. With verse after verse giving blueprint style measurements, materials, and building directions, Truma on first glance, is hardly an enthralling parasha, though of course there were and there are treasures hidden within. This time, after Rabbi Linder told me that I would be speaking here on Shabbat Zecho, the Shabbat before Purim, and considered thus a special Shabbat, I must tell you that what I felt was not disappointment but rather something closer to panic. <laughs> it was unclear to me how I could talk about this week's reading at all. Allow me to contextualize the meaning in the biblical texts of Shabbat Zechol. On this special Shabbat, additional verses are added to the regular Torah portion, and an entirely different Haftarah is read after the Torah portion. Both the additional verses and the Haftarah are all about Amalek. 
As you may recall, the nomadic nation of the Amalekites was the first people to attack and fight the Israelites after they came out of Egypt, when they were, as the biblical verse tells us, quote, enfeebled, faint, and weary. Under the leadership of Moses and with divine intervention, the Israelites prevailed and triumphed. At battle's end, in verses from the book of Exodus, which are repeated with even greater fierceness in the book of Deuteronomy, the Israelites are given three commandments, and these three commandments are part of the 613. And these commandments are one, to remember what Amalek did to you, to blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens, that's two, and finally, three, to not forget. What is the connection to Purim, you may be asking? As Jewish tradition has it, Haman is a descendant of the Amalekites, and one of the reasons given for the tradition of making noise enough to drown out Haman's name during the Megillah reading is to fulfill the commandment of blotting out the Amalek in this symbolic way. Now you know why you do it. That's the context in a nutshell. An ancient tale of warfare and retaliation. A foe named as arch enemy to be remembered always. So you may be wondering, why my panic on learning that this would be the Shabbat on which I would speak? The reason has to do with what Amalek has come to signify in our Jewish and Israeli culture and tradition, and the lessons we are supposed to learn from the story of Amalek. Amalek is every nation that has ever risen up against us, and there have been many. Amalek is Haman. Amalek is Hitler. Amalek is, or was for many years, Arafat and the PLO. Amalek is Hamas and Hezbollah. For some Jews today, and some Israelis, Amalek is every Arab and Palestinian. Those whose presence and claims are viewed as a challenge to Jewish sovereignty in the Jewish homeland. And the directive, remember what Amalek has done unto you, is transformed into a litany of all the bloodshed, the terrorist attacks, the refrain of what they did to us. The directive to remember it all becomes an ethos of remembering and not forgiving an ethos of refusing to look forward, an ethos of believing there is only one narrative and only one truth in the bloody, broken, and very beloved Israeli landscape. I want to be clear in conveying to you as exactly as I can what happens in my heart when I hear the words, Zechor et asher asa lecha Amalek, remember what Amalek has done unto you. And I am speaking as an Israeli and a Jew both. These words are not metaphoric or symbolic. They are not at a historical remove. In the world in which I live, the ancient modern land of Israel, these words are taken at face value. Hence, these words strike fear in my heart because they are insisting on a vengefulness that I know will lead to nothing but more violence. These words reject the possibility of any resolution in my region, 
of any accord that will necessarily demand of both sides compromise and concessions. These words seem to demand that we Jews and we Israelis live on the sword and by the sword until all Amalekites are blotted out from under the heavens, which will never happen. Of course, I'm not suggesting we should forget the catastrophes of our past. I know, as we all do, how essential remembering is to our tradition and our survival. It is remembering that has preserved us against all odds. It is our remembering of the Shabbat, keeping the Shabbat, zecho et yom ha-Shabbat le-kotcho, that has preserved us as individuals and as a people who are profoundly blessed to have the sacred integrated so organically into our lives. And I'm thinking now of my father of blessed memory, a religious Jew and a workaholic who used to say that it was not he who kept the Sabbath, but rather the Sabbath that kept him, kept him sane and healthy, gifting him every single week with a full 25 hours of rest and family togetherness. And it is our remembering of our past as slaves and strangers in a foreign land, v'zacharta ki eved hayita be'eretz mitzrayim, that has led to a compassion and care for all the dispossessed and oppressed, a compassion and care that is also an intrinsic element of our religion. But I have seen in these last decades how the commandment to remember the violence visited upon us from the pogroms and the Holocaust through every war and every terrorist attack, how it has hardened our hearts as a people, has made us deaf and blind to the sufferings of others, has led to an entrenched and damaging self-righteousness, has damaged our younger generations as they imbibe these traumas with the air they breathe, and has, in my opinion, created an Israeli national narrative that refuses to consider peace an option. The directive, remember what Amalek has done unto you, keeps us ever wedded to a victim position, which leads to nothing but more victims. As the Hebrew poet Tuvia Rubner wrote at the beginning of his poem, Victim, again, he is a survivor, his entire family was slaughtered in the Holocaust, he writes, being a victim again, what a task. Here and there both, a victim begets a victimizer. A victimizer begets a knife. A knife begets fear. Fear begets hatred. Hatred, wickedness, and wickedness like locusts greedily eat parcel after parcel of the bleeding land. I will not have it. I refuse that relentless cycle of violence. I refuse that narrative for myself, for my three children, for their children, God willing, for all the people I love, Jew and Arab alike. So what can I do with the commandment Zechor et asher asa lecha amalek on this Shabbat Zechor. As I prepared myself to write this drasha, I walked around my Galilean home for a few days in a state of distress. I couldn't find any way into this Torah portion that was true to me. I read other interpretations online and became even more distressed. 
as every interpretation I found was directed towards identifying one's enemies, not the way I wanted to go. Then my life partner offered me the following, and I started to breathe again. This is what he offered. In ancient days, he said, indeed one had to remember Amalek, actual Amalek, as one's survival as a wandering tribe or later as an exiled and persecuted people depended on being ever ready for the next attack. That was then. Now our lives are different. Now we must think of the commandment differently. Remember what Amalek has done unto you must be read as a directive to remember what war has done unto you. Remember the losses. Remember the pain and strife, the suffering, the endlessness of it all. Remember it so that you can work tirelessly to end it. In the summer of 2014, my eldest son, Daniel Chen, went to war in Gaza. He was a combat paramedic in an elite airborne search and rescue unit. For three weeks, he and his unit gathered up wounded soldiers from Gaza, ministered first life-saving measures, measures then hurried them onto helicopters, taking them to Soroka Hospital in Beersheba. There is absolutely no way to describe to you those three weeks. In the north, we sat by the news and by the phone. We watched every report of casualties without breathing. We watched the complete destruction being visited on Gaza. We watched the fear of Israeli citizens in the southern towns. And we prayed in our secular fashion that our son would return to us safely. Daniel did return to us, thank God, though he was lost to us for a long period after suffering from the shock and trauma of war. And he is, as we are, forever changed. After the war, I wrote many poems, that's what I do, about my son and his suffering, about the children of Gaza and the children of Shtirot, about all our fears and wounds, both our peoples. I wanted to share with you one of these poems which offers two images of two little boys, Sahir Abu Namuz, who was killed on the Gaza beach, and Daniel Tragerman, who was killed in the Shterot living room in that sad summer of 2014. The poem reads as follows. He was only three years old. He was four and soon to turn five. He already knew most of the letters. He was first born devoted to the baby sister. He was second born always the younger brother. He was killed in the evening at play in the street. He was killed in the afternoon in the home shuttered peace. The dome play tent yellow and red stands undisturbed also after. In the photo, he is all little boy pride standing tall beside the colorful tower he's built, slender and so serious. In the photo, bundled in small denim coat, he sits by the sea, he is smiling. It must be a first evening breeze. It was mortar fire, it was missile. It was or it wasn't preemptive. It was or it wasn't retaliatory. The little boy body wrapped in shrouds is now the single certainty. Zecho, remember them. Remember their mothers and fathers, their siblings. Remember all the lost lives. 
Remember those who say there is no one with whom we can speak peace and refuse that. This is not true. Remember that conflicts around the world, which were once thought irresolvable, were in the end resolved. Remember that we Jews value life above all else. Remember that tolerance begets tolerance, compassion begets compassion. Remember that we are all Jews, Christians, Muslims created in the divine image. Remember that as Psalm 34 beautifully states, the one who desires and loves life is not the one caught in memories of Amalek. It is the one, Hamvakesh Shalom Uradfehu. It is he and it is she who seeks peace and actively pursues it with the remembering of all our children safe in their beds, propelling us passionately forward. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Begging only be the fun.